Welcome back to the Crypto's Key Conversation. In this video, I'm going to take a look at some Empower Oversight updates in regards to the Ripple vs. SEC stuff, them com coming after the SEC for the Freedom of Information Act stuff. There's some more updates coming from Johnny Deaton's crypto law that we're going to take a look at. Uh, we're going to take a look at Congressman Tom Emmer and him kind of going after the SEC with this letter they had developed. J.W. Verrett has a great tweet that we're going to cover. We're going to look at what Cointelegraph had put in their article here. It says, Chairman from the SEC and CFTC, so uh, I think it's Burnham and Gensler, talk crypto regulations at ISDA meeting. And then we're going to go into some of the, some of the stuff blockchain backers have been talking about in his technical analysis of kind of what's going on in the market. And obviously the whole Terra UST crash that's been, you know, in a sense, adding and compounding more weight on this devastation within our markets overall. So we're going to take a look at all that quickly looking at Coin Echo here. As you can see, we're seeing a lot of blood in the streets. One point three trillion dollar market cap currently down ten point eight. Uh, percent in the past 24 hours and I, as you can see bitcoin sitting at 28,617 at the recording of this video ethereum sitting at almost you know just above 2000 xrp is at 40 cents saw it at 38 cents not too long ago so there's a lot of uh of red in this market so much fear going on we're currently sitting at 12 and when this thing updates in an hour and two minutes i definitely see this thing being back at 10 or below 10 just like yesterday so there's still a lot of market uncertainty uh there's a lot of stuff going on with you know terra and the luna foundation or yeah the luna foundation uh the ust and there's been speculations of you know some iffy things when it comes to uh you know tether and kind of what's going on with their own chain uh data and analytics so there's a lot of uncertainty, so all we can kind of do is just wait and see as, you know, everyday investors and kind of see what happens with this market and uh, continue to hold strong if we have the ability to do so. So coming over here, we're going to start with this one from Crypto Law US, and this is Johnny Deaton's firm here. It says, why the Empower Oversight? So Empower Oversight with Jason Foster. So why the Empower Oversight a referral is a turning point. According to the general principles of federal ethics, quote, employees shall endeavor to avoid any actions creating the appearance that they are violating the law or ethical standards. Whether particular circumstances create an appearance that the law or these standards have been violated shall be determined from the perspective of a reasonable person with knowledge of the relevant facts. A reasonable person aware of Hemmons' full conflict of interest in all matters involving Simpson Thatcher may perceive Hemmons' actions affecting Ethereum as being a conflict of interest after Simpson Thatcher joined the uh, Ether uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, so the EEA. Hemen may have violated a criminal prohibition, uh, prohibition against personally and substantially participating in particular matters that would have a direct and predictable effect on the financial interest of entities whose interests could be uh, imputed to him. Even if all the uh, statutory elements are not met in, in order, make his actions a criminal violation of 18 U.S.C. 208. These actions still violate ethics regulations. Hemen violated ethics regulations and created enough of an appearance of a potential criminal violation that an official investigation by the SEC, IG, OGE, and, and or the DOJ is necessary to make the determination of any potential criminality and to restore the public trust in the SEC's imp um, impartiality. Even if an investigation determines that Hammond's actions did not rise to the level of a criminal violation of, you know, 5 U.S.C. 208, Hammond violated ethics requirements and should be investigated by the SC, OGE, and or DOJ and potentially disqualified from appearing or practicing before the commission in the future. So this is kind of tied in to kind of what's this whole, you know, uh, narrative going on in regards of what's going on with the Ripple versus SC stuff, the so-called ETHgate scandal and Ethereum free pass speech that William Hemmings gave and, you know, all the parties that were involved in it when it comes to consensus, Joe Lubin and other members uh, coming over here. Johnny Deaton's also saying, based on this, I'm going to pull it up real quick, but he says, Empower Oversight and Jason Foster retrieved emails below. If Hemmings didn't submit the speech to conflict screening, it is a game set and match. The ethics office is going to be pissed and want to throw him under the bus if we force this investigation through letters from Congress. So obviously we were quickly talking about uh, a letter that I'm going to be covering that was already sent to Chairman Gensler. So he's talking about, you know, running it up to uh, to actually push this. Uh, yeah, to actually push this agenda here. So if we come in here and you can kind of take a look at uh, you can pause the screen and take a look or you can come and look at. Uh, Crypto Law US or Johnny Deaton's and you can kind of see what's going on. So obviously two, uh, Shira Pavis Minton from uh, Bill Hemon. And then uh, if we come over here, there was something that was brought up right here. Right here. 
uh, right here. So it says, I have, the, I think this is him speaking. So it says, I have instructed Tamara uh, Brightwell to screen all SEC matters directed to my attention that involve outside entities or that require um, my participation to determine if they involve any of the entities or organizations listed above. So I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about these here, these organizations here. So if we come over here, uh, there was a conversation that had uh, right here. So it says, this is from a uh, cryptonym. Kryptonum. It says, is Tamara his out? If she was supposed to be screening uh, for him, he can't, can he just say that uh, he was unaware of the potential conflicts because Tamara didn't do her job? And then uh, Johnny D in a crypto law says, uh, him and had the responsibility to submit it to her. So uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of information, but we're going to continue to push on here and kind of see how things unfold here. Uh, coming over here. He says the Empire Oversight Referral is a big deal. All the referral is asking is that the IG do their very thing it exists to do. I will be submitting a request to the members of the Banking Oversight Committee to fulfill their oversight duties. All they need to do is support the referral. So he says when the IG and congressional members start asking why this speech wasn't cleared, what do you think the SC ethics folks do? Defend him? In? It begins a cascade, a basic conflicts check would have come back that him and cannot give the speech. Someone else must have, or must give it or not give it. So, I mean, it, the hammer, the hammer's dropping, man. Uh, or as he says, uh, Hinman's ship is sinking. Empire Oversight says, uh, is quoting this Law 360, which is absolutely massive. When things are put in Law 360, that people tend to pay attention here. So, uh, it says, quote, Empower Oversight claims Hinman didn't follow instructions that the SC Ethics Office gave him to avoid conflicts tied to his financial interests in Simpson Thatcher, including the firm's connection to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, or EEA. And then you have Tim. <laughs> right on, right on. So, moving on here, I wanted to cover this because Tom Ember, uh, he had put up, it says right here, it says, actually, let's go to this real quick. It says, this is why I sent a bipartisan letter today to SEC chair and, and all parties regarding the SEC's crypto information seeking process because it was almost, no, it's, that wasn't almost, it's it's true. It's like they almost bring, they say, hey, come in and come and have a conversation with us. But then when you come in, all they're doing is gathering information to further attack you down the line. So if you're trying to do things the right way and try to be transparent and try to figure out how do you proceed forward going the right way, being law abiding, being uh, investor protection abiding and so on, all they do is gather that information on how you're doing, you know, building your, 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 um, your platform or your your asset and your t utility or whatever the case is, and they're going to use it against you, just like they did with Library, just like they did with uh, Ripple and uh, Ripple and the Ripple versus SC case. So he says, while the SC has authority to obtain info from market participants for rulemaking purposes, it must ensure that these inquiries do not infringe on the standards established in the Paperwork Reduction Act, which limits the burden the government imposes on private businesses and citizens. Crypto startups must not be weighed down by extra uh, jurisdictional and and uh, burden some reporting requirements. We will ensure our regulators do not kill American innovation and opportunity. So he had said this back on March 16th. So if we come back over here, he had, after the fact, he had pretty much called out like uh, Chair Gensler, like, hey, you know, we sent these letters and we still haven't heard from you. So now he's saying, for your information, Gary Gensler, responded to our, our bipartisan uh, oversight letter on the SEC. This should say, responded to our bipartisan letter oversight, or excuse me, he, it's just say, FY, Gary Gensler finally responded to our bipartisan oversight letter on the SC's crypto info collection process. Gensler's response does not provide Congress with the specific data and insights we requested in our 13 questions. Don't worry, CT. We will obtain this information. <laughs> so... I'm, 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 I hope Tom Emmer and, and more congressmen and women can really come together and really just drop the hammer on Chair Gensler and really wrap this thing up so we can get the regulatory clarity this space needs and get the right governing body and the right members in there that are going to be fair and just and do things the right way. So the health and, uh, and the health and growth of this space and the innovation and entrepreneurship that's developed in this space stays within the United States and grows and is prosperous within the United States so it can spread out to the entire industry. Johnny Deaton says uh, he's responding to digital asset investors because he asked him a question. He says, hey, John Deaton, I, I, uh, I get a question. He says the SEC has immunity. Bill Hemmen, while at the SEC, had immunity. What removes the immunity or how does it get pierced? He says, I will do a, a thread later on, but know this. It is called, quote, qualified immunity. 
it is not called absolute or complete immunity. He is immunized for actions and conduct committed within the scope of his duties. Criminal conduct isn't within that scope. So, oh baby, man, I'm ex I'm excited to see this thing continue to go, and I'm I'm glad, you know. More pressure is being applied to kind of what's going on. We need more eyes. We need more awareness. We need to make, make sure we keep sending this stuff on and, you know, joining the crypto laws, all their actions that they, you know, they have us do, like whether that's sending a letter to our, you know, our government officials within our, you know, states and cities or whatever the case is, we got to do our part. So, you know, our voices are heard. So this stuff doesn't get swept under the rug. J.W. Barrett has something to say here. It says there are many crypto firms that want to operate inside the regulatory perimeter. And financial regulators have prevented them from doing so. Financial regulators, including SEC and bank regulators, are responsible for harm from boxing crypto firms out. Absolutely. And that comes into now. Uh, Cointelegraph has this uh, article here that says chairman from the SEC, so Gensler and CFTC, uh, Denham, uh, talk crypto regulations at uh, ISDA meeting. It says, Rostin Benham and um, Gary Gensler make their positions clear in keynote addresses at the annual meeting of the ISDA with Sam Bankman Fried in, in attendance. So if I come down here, it says, um, uh, where's it at? So Benham went to went on to recall his February Senate testimony. He says, quote, I will be continuing advocating for and supporting legislative authority for the CFTC to develop a regulatory framework for the cash digital asset commodity market. Currently, the CFTC only regulates derivative markets, although uh, it has exerted enforcement authority over cash markets such as the fine it uh, the fine it imposed on Coinbase for improper reporting of exchange volume and self training in 2021. Uh, Gensler spoke at about the quote the intersection of crypto assets with derivatives in his in his speech. So it says quote this is from Gensler, if platforms whether in the decentralized or centralized finance space offer security based swaps, they are implicated by the securities laws and must work within our securities regimen. Gensler stressed the need for the ISDA quote to recognize that if the underlying asset is a security, the derivative must comply with securities regulations as it develops legal standards for crypto derivatives. So, I don't know, man. The verbiage needs to, to needs to be addressed. We need to really, uh, you know, redefine these major terms that are thrown around in the community. And we honestly need proper regulatory, uh, you know, a proper regulatory framework and clarity for this for the space. There's too much confusion going around, which is absolutely crazy to think, you know, with this new and emerging technology. And obviously we're being decimated right now with so many negative narratives and all it's doing is feed into, you know, Senator Elizabeth Warren's and, and you know, the other people that have certain uh, reservations against the space. All they're doing is literally gaining strength and as to why they need certain CBDCs, you know, to be rolled out a certain way, or they need, you know, this type, you know, regulatory constraint on the, on the space. It's, it's crazy. Crazy man. Moving on, blockchain backers. One of the analysts I follow, and I highly value his insight and his TA. Uh, he says Bitcoin has now set a new yearly low. So if we come in here and look at this, he has this screenshot here where obviously, if you caught it at twenty eight thousand six hundred twenty five, as you can see, it's the new yearly low. So coming over here. It's kind of hit home with me because BC Backer's a guy I've been watching over the years, and I, I highly value you know his input. He's been very correct on a, a lot of his his TA, which is outstanding. He says I was wrong about how low these altcoins can go. It saddens me. Getting the tops of Bitcoin and Ethereum aren't enough. I seek perfection, which I'm clearly not. My work defines me. I commit so much time to it. I still huddle just looks like it'll be longer. So with that being said, there's so many things that, you know, TA guys like BC Backer can't control, you know, when it comes to media narratives and, you know, bad actors, you know, Wells manipulating markets. All they can do is go based on past evidence and kind of give their best, cast their best judgment on, you know, how things can not be exact, but kind of how can they can have like a rhyme or rhythm to them to where, you know, it can kind of have a rough guesstimation of where things are going to go. So he does a great job of being, you know, uh, uh, unbiased and, and trying to look at every angle, good and bad, to see, you know, how things align based on past uh, markets and market cycles and trends. So uh, BC Back, I just want to let you know, man, we love you, bro. You got, you know, you got a lot of love and respect in the community and uh, you just keep doing what you're doing, man, because a lot of people look up to you and they value what you have to say. Uh, moving on here, 
when I talk about, you know, whether it's a gray swan, black swan event or whatever, there's a lot of things that, you know, TA guys like BC Backer can't control. Like I was talking about, you know, uh, bad actors, just bad things happening. Uh, you know, you have pandemics and so on. That affects what goes on in markets, obviously. So now one of our bigger ones is this whole Terra Luna Foundation and UST crash, like the depegging of the UST stablecoin. So it says, why did Terra Luna and UST crash? Find out on the market report. So, you, I mean, you can come in here and read this article, but I just wanted to cover these headlines here. It says, Luna Meltdown Sparks Theories and Toji Shows from the Crypto Community. Some of you saw it coming. Some of you still can't believe it's real. Was this most significant collapse in crypto history a, an attack? So there's been conversation of it being, you know, on purpose to fit, you know, government official regulate or regulators agenda to fit their narrative. Who knows what what really is the deal? But there's something that I want to bring up. I, I talked about another um, uh, thread. I think it was like four, four, eight, four. Someone had, you know, kind of gave their testimony on why they thought, you know, this whole Terra and UST stable coin depegging happened. But if you come in here, this is as forwarded from Anna. And I think it's quite interesting. It says <clears throat> BlackRock and Citadel borrowed 100,000 Bitcoin from Gemini. It appears in their loan book. They swapped 25,000 of that BTC into UST. So Terra Luna stablecoin says this was all done quietly in anticipation of the attack. When the time was right, they called up Do Kwan at Terra Foundation and said they wanted to sell a lot of Bitcoin for UST. As it was a large trade, they told him they didn't want to move the market and asked if he could, or excuse me, and asked if he would like to buy their large block of Bitcoin at a discount for UST. Do Kwan took the bait. He gave them a huge chunk of UST, thus lowering the UST liquidity significantly. At that point, BlackRock Citadel dumped all the BTC and UST, causing massive slippage and tripping a cascade of force selling in both assets. The real problem was BlackRock Citadel knew that Anchor, which holds a lot of Luna, was a Ponzi scheme. They offered 20% stake in APY for uh, Chris Stake. It says, and this crash would trigger more withdrawals than Anchor can repay. This are these forced withdrawals and selling would trigger a massive sell-off in Luna, thus further breaking the $1 peg and wrecking the market further. BlackRock and Citadel can now buy the Bitcoin back cheaply to repay the loan and pocket the difference. Meanwhile, billions of longs in Bitcoin's uh, VARs were wiped out. This was pure market manipulation. So <laughs> whether this was how was a part of the, the, the plan or a part of the attack or whatever, or whether it was an attack or was it a part of, you know, a group of uh, entities or a group of people's plan, it's quite interesting because it's like two things, things seemed, I mean, it, it almost seems like it just, it's too much of a coincidence how things happen, you know, uh, but there's also been ta uh, talks of, you know, Doquan being a part of another stable coin that failed and there's just so many things going on, but I thought this was quite interesting and it, it kind of makes me think like, okay, you know, if they have the ability to pull off something like this, why wouldn't they do it? You know, when they can literally crash the market down to where it's at and purchase instead of buying Bitcoin in the forties or 50 thousands, they can buy it in the, uh, you know, mid to high twenties. Like, why wouldn't they do that if they have the ability to do it and they can get away with it? You know, it's crazy, man. There's crazy times. You know, um, I see a lot of negativity out there and it's totally understandable. And it's OK if you're into particularly are upset or hurt. Your portfolio is decimated just like the rest of us. I can just say, you know, there's never financial advice here. But like if you have the ability to accumulate more, this is a great time to do it. If you would like to, you know, you, you look at projects that you couldn't invest into the past because, you know, they ran up too high. You know, this is a great opportunity to dollar cross average on your major bag holdings and, and get into new projects if you have the ability to do so. Now, with that being said, after that, you know, the assets that you do hold, whether you're looking to buy or not, like if you have the ability, you know, being able to pay your monthly bills and being able to take your kids and your take care of your kids and family, you have a, a good job. You have the ability to hold through these hard times. My experience being in here since 2017, early 2018, like the hodling was probably the best thing that I possibly could have done. And I've done a lot of dumb things in this market, but hodlings has been the best, quite honestly, getting it in a solid product and just holding on. So if you have the ability to do so, just like I always say, stay strong out there. And just know that it's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to be hurt. We all are. And uh, you're not alone there. With all that being said, keep keep continuing to educate yourself. Stay in it. Keep up to date with what's going on in this space. Hoddle if you can. Hold strong. Dollar cost average. Stay strong out there. Be safe.